Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the second day of our 25th uh, International Science Initiation Symposium. And to announce our first speaker of today, I'm calling to the stage Professor Edila Maimenez. Thank you, Paul. Uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, it's a great pleasure present you in this morning, Professor, Professor Dazi Wang. Uh, professor Dazi Wang is a full professor in uh, Cardiovascular Research Division of the Children's Hospital in Boston at the Harvard uh, Medical School. Uh, professor, you are very welcome in our university to, to do this, this first lecture in this morning. Thank you for coming. Good morning. It's um, it's my great honor to be here. Um, so when I was uh, asked to speak here, I was wondering what I should be talking about. Then, since myself is a scientist, I thought I would uh, tell you about, uh, as a scientist, I got a dream job. I hope I can convince you this is indeed a dream job. OK, so um, I've been here for a week. Uh, it, I'm very impressed to see this country, this city, this university. And I have learned a lot from you, even though I still could not talk to you in Portuguese. Um, OK, thank you. Um, so I'm going to share with you my own experience and my fun part of uh, being a scientist. Here we go. So I came from Boston, a beautiful city, where is a very well-known university. I don't think it's just because of the name of the university. It's because the environment it provides us as human beings, we've been there, being able to do our dream job. How many of you have been able to visit Boston before? So quite a few. Um, again, as I said, it's a beautiful place. Um, I work for this university. Harvard University, was, which was built in 1636, almost um, 400 years. Uh, probably many people heard about it. There is a big eye about this status. This is a Harvard, but this is not a Harvard himself. Um, then here is the knock of the university. This is the gate of the university. For students at Harvard, you only cross this gate once, once you get in, and when you get out. This is a beautiful Harvard yard over there, particularly during the fall right now. Uh, it's uh, very beautiful here. I work in Harvard Medical School. It's a separate campus, just like here, USP. Main campus here, then you have a medical center in downtown. So uh, Harvard Medical School is in the Boston area, looks like that. So now, I'm asking what's your dream job? Um, we probably have different perspectives, particularly when we grow up. Maybe this is your dream job, or part of your dream. Or you want to be something else. Um, or you want to be a leader for this government or the other government. <laughs> um, well, again, I hope I convince you there is another different type of dream job, which is to be a scientist. And we have a great scientist, a very respected scientist, Albert Einstein. So why? Scientist, why science is a fun job. So we know that actually science is transforming our life. 
No matter when you look at the sky, look at the universe, you have many, many questions you want to get an answer about it. That's what a science job do. And uh, even if you look at the global Earth we are living on, again, you probably have many, many questions. You are curious about it, know about it. Then if we focus on ourselves, you know our body, our healthy, everything, you are curious about it too. Even some of those are daily life use, like the smartphone everybody carries, and you know there is a science that designed by a scientist, driven by science technology, and that's really important to transform our life. But I think um, what I would like to tell you about more about it is uh, to be a scientist is a fun job, not just to say you have all the burden load on your shoulders, so you're going to transform the world. Probably what you do, you will. But uh, by doing science itself, it's a fun job. So let's see, what would you like to do when you were a kid? Probably this is what you like to do, right? To play. Just like that. So now we are all growing up. Then what kind of job would you like to do? Continue to play? So our playground changed. So here is your playground. And we can play over there. This is a couple of pictures of my own station. So I will tell you a little bit of my own experience I grew up in China. I studied plant biology as an undergraduate student. And then I got a master's degree, continued to study plants. After that, I went to USA, uh, started my PhD program. I was thinking about a continuing to study plant biology. But some different experiences opened my eyes to look at biomedical research. So I decided to study development of biology because I was fascinated by the process of human development or self-development. Um, I got my PhD degree at the University of Iowa in the middle of the state. Then after that, I started my postdoc training at the University of Texas Medical Center this is my bench when I was a poster. Uh, I don't know whether you can tell that some of the detail is a pretty messy bench, but uh, to me, I was so fortunate to have this playground to play and to fulfill many of my curiosity. This is my desk at that time. So I have a laptop computer, I have a desk here, and I have tons of papers piled up there and they enjoy writing papers, thinking about scientific questions, then trying to perform experiment to get some answers. So, I don't know whether you agree with me or not. Science is fun. So let me share with you a couple of um, my research experience. As I told you, Yeah, the technology is playing with us. Um, when we were kids, we have a lot of curiosity. We ask mom and dad, what is this, why is this, why is that? I don't know, after you're growing up, for all of us, you are sitting here, I'm standing here, do you still have this curiosity? Or you are stressed out by your daily life? by the traffic of St. Paul, or by the hot weather make you sweat, or your girlfriend, the boyfriend, you just want to date them, or anything else. But I think it's very important that if we still keep our curiosity from our childhood to keep going on, to ask what is going on in this world. Okay, 
So I think that's what I'm trying to um, give you this message to be a scientist. It's a fun job, it's a dream job, it's also a fantastic job where you can ask a question, then you can find answers. We are interested in our human body, trying to figure out how during the development it was formed, how genetics control really give us our body, we're coming from our parents, how come we look like uh, similar to my parents, but uh, different. Then if you look around your friends, well, some of us look like a short, like a me, like an Asian face, some of you have uh, different uh, faces. But how did everything happen here? We are more particularly interested in our heart. We are trying to understand how heart is formed during the development, then how the heart disease happened. I don't know whether all of you or some of you are aware of it, that a human cardiovascular disease is the leading cause for lethality. In other words, heart disease kill more people than any other disease, including cancer. Um, so showing you here are uh, like uh, uh, anatomy or histology of human hearts. In the middle is the normal human heart, a section of this. We know we have four chamber hearts. There are left ventricle, right ventricle, but uh, you probably can easily tell that the other two hearts set on left side or right side, they're very abnormal. So we have some description about some of those um, disease status, and this is called hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, where you can see our ventricle wall was uh, much thickened. And on your right side is called dilated cardiomyopathy, uh, where you can see the uh, ventricle wall was uh, really uh, decreased the, the wall thickness, and the ventricle chamber was dramatically uh, dilated. All of those studies you probably can imagine will not be good for the heart. So we are trying to understand the cardiac development, cardiac function, and the related cardiac diseases. We studied this in an area so-called microRNAs, where you know our gene, our genetic um, information encoded in our body will be decoded by multiple steps. Some of those genes encode the material called non-coding RNA or microRNAs. So this uh, diagram just show you the process of how microRNAs were produced and being modified and how they function. So Jeff Chen, he was a former graduate student. He is a professor right now at the University of South California decide to look into this pathway, then he asked questions, just like, okay, say so how important are microRNAs to the heart? So to get the answer for that, Jeff decided to block this pathway. Specifically, we use a mouse model to study this to allow us better understand it. So Jeff basically generated knockout mice, I don't know whether you heard about it. Basically, you manipulated the genome and you can delete all the genetic information from the cell. Then the animals will come out without this particular functional gene. So Jeff specifically delete our dicer in mouse um, genome. And what he observed was have you seen those uh, newborn pup, pups? Young man? So here is a control, normal wild type, first day after birth mouse, and this is a mutant. So the mutant basically cannot sustain the deletion of this gene, and they die shortly after birth. Then we start to look at why they die, what went wrong with those animals. So Jeff decided to look into those. We took the cell biology and the molecular biology, 
physiology approaches to study and try to figure out what went wrong with those. What Jeff found was, well, when you denatal the dicer gene in the heart, the heart and the morphology was affected. There is a dramatic dilation for the ventricle. Then if you look at histoimmunology, where the structure and uh, the component of many key proteins which are essential for the heart formation was affected. Oh, this cannot be seen very well. So this is a very um, straightforward, simple study just to try to ask the question, what is the important function of those microRNA, microRNA pathways to the heart? Uh, Jeff took this genetic approach that mutated this gene in mouse model, and from this study, what we learned was, okay, this gene is essential for proper cardiac morphogenesis, cardiac function, and essential for life. Now, in human beings, we found that indeed, when this dicer gene was mutated, it was associated with many type of diseases. Um, we did a very similar work. This is Zhang Peng Huang, a poster in the lab. Uh, decided to ask whether same uh, genetic pathway play a role in during the development from neural crest to the heart. I've been in, working in a children's hospital. We know congenital heart defect and many other congenital defects were associated. Many kids who have a genetic defect in their cardiovascular system, they also have cranial facial defect in their face structure. Sometimes their intellectual development was affected. And Zampong conducted this study. What he found was when we block this pathway in a group of cell called a neural crest cell, those cells during the development will migrate from our neural tube into the heart, into the cranial facial to build our cardiovascular system and the, and the face. So when we block this pathway in the neural crest cell, we got a monster cranial facial, those mutant animals looking like a very bad in their face and their skeleton and their um, heart were also affected. So again, this type of study really allow us to understand the normal development and the disease process. Um, another poster, Jian Ding, in the lab, um, asked another question. He asked how is the specificity of the heart development and the function is determined. So he decided to come back to this genetic pathway. We know there are many players control this process to get the answer out of it. So Jen decided to study this protein called TRBP. You don't have to know detail about it. It's a RNA binding protein which binds to RNA and control the process of biological process. So Jen again made a mutation in this gene in animal, and what he found was those animals are smaller when you compare to their controls, and those animals gradually die out. Then we ask what went wrong with those animals. We looked at their hearts. So if you have not looked at the uh, mouse hearts, on the top is the wow type controls, just the newborn heart, and this is a different aged heart. And at the bottom part is the mutant heart when you study. And you can use a different technology. You can look at histology and look at it. There is abnormality in this heart. You can also measure the function. So if as a human being, if you say, well, I don't feel um, very comfortable with my heart, you can go to cardiologist. They can use the ultrasound, echocardiography to 
measures of cardiac function. So we can do that in our experimental animal system. This is just showing you an example of echocardiography image. Here is a control animal, here is a mutant, and this is indicated the heart beating. And there is a normal heart beating strongly, but when you make a mutation in those animals, they cannot beat very well. Then we keep asking why and why, and we are trying to figure out what was affected. So we took the technology of RNA sequencing. We sequenced the whole genome sequence, compared that in the wild type control versus the mutant. Then we identify many, many genes which are affected. Through those affected genes, we very further um, identify additional candidate and try to figure out how this are affected. And we keep digging out more evidence, try to allow us to understand what is going on. So I skip many of the details, but I'm just showing you how we approach those. Then we, with those evidence, we can have some textable uh, scientific hypothesis. This is some of our testable hypothesis. We believe this protein control the downstream targets, then this target control uh, biological processes. So you always can test those hypotheses. This is also a fun part of doing science. You can see whether this is correct or this is wrong. And in this case, we thought this DRPP uh, repress the SUC6, then SUC6 repress the so-called stow twitch myofiber genes. When you mutate this TRPP, SUC6 repressor is gone, went up, and this uh, final product was repressed. So we decided, okay, can we test this? And we do more complicated experiments. And the bottom line is yes. So here showing you some of the heart images. Here is the control normal heart. Here is abnormal heart, which is a sick. Um, then we say, well, if we play with the different pathways, can we uh, functionally or morphologically restore this uh, morphology and function of the heart? And we did. And the most important thing, if we uh, make another mutation into the downstream gene, those animals can survive. This is a surviving curve. I already given to you, say, when you make a genetics mutation, those mutant animals start to die out. But if you uh, modify the downstream genes, now those animals can nicely survive. So I don't know how much you got the detail about those study. What I'm trying to share with you is, you're coming out with some fascinating questions. Then you're coming out with the experimental system to allow you to test some of the hypotheses. During this process of testing, examination, it's a really amazing world uh, uh, unfolded in front of you. So from this type of study, what we got was, we know in the normal heart, there is a genetic pathway. There are multiple players control each other's expressing and the function. Then when we make a mutation from here, we saw disturbation of downstream players, downstream signals. Then we uh, add additional experiment to prove this is the case. We could rescue it, we could mimic it, and this allows us to draw a scientific conclusion. And what we learn about this could allow us to bring to clinical. So right now, several of those players I was talking about, we have um, well, we have a patent for this. Then biotech companies are interested in this, try to see whether we can develop this into biomarkers to announce the diagnosis disease or to develop some of those into therapeutic targets that could help to uh, treat human diseases. 
So then you may ask, um, what, how to have fun or how to be successful? I don't know whether I see myself a successful scientist or not, but I, at least I feel like I've been very fortunate to be able to continue to uh, study, continue to explore, continue to have fun. So I hope you are going to do the same thing. And then the question is how to have a successful scientific career. So I just give you several bullet point uh, to see whether you agree or don't agree. So to be a successful scientist or to have fun, well, you first have to have a very strong desire, self-motivation. I think you guys are sitting there building your self-motivation now. You said after my lecture, you can say, yes, I want to be a scientist. I'm going to go with it. So then you got to ask the right question. Okay, there are so many questions as I indicated when you were a young child, you ask your mom and dad, say, why during the daytime there is a sun, during the evening time there is a moon, or there are many, many questions. So once you grow up, you want to ask very important questions. Where are now you to explore, allow you to test, and hopefully allow you to find answers. And you have to have uh, uh, creativity and imagination. So if you forget about this, if you forget when we grow up, we ask the questions, we are curious about this world, then you need to rebuild your curiosity, you build your uh, imagination. I think that is a very important character for a uh, scientist. So I hope you are going to um, really come up with this uh, imagination, creativity. Then once you said, okay, now I'm motivated, I want to be a scientist, I am asking the important questions, I'm asking the right questions, I have some imagination, then what you need to do, what you need to have, you need to have responsibility. You probably don't want to do something to start with, then walking away uh, without constantly working on it or constantly uh, taking responsibility. So we need to take responsibility, take ownership on this. Sometimes I observe some of our students say, come here to the professor, what do you want me to do? Or I ask them what they have done, then say, then what's next? They did not take this, their ownership. They should be, this is my project. This is my curiosity. I want to do this to find answer myself. Of course, in a teamwork. So you need to take a responsibility. You need to have um, ownership. In many cases, we need to uh, make decisions. So what I just share with you very briefly, some of our experiments sounds like a straightforward story from point A, you got a point B, got a point C. Well, in the real world, it's not the case. You probably, from A, there is a possible B here, there is a possible B plus here, there is a possible B minus here, so you pretty much have to make some decision. And you need to have, a, in my word, as a sharp judgment. You need to make this decision. Then you said, how can I make this decision? Many of those will depend on experience. If you constantly learn, constantly study, constantly build your knowledge, you are going to be able to uh, make the right decision make this right judgment. So as some of those uh, uh, very prominent prof professors will tell you, this is not the right, this is the correct. So you get a heavy experience. Then sometimes uh, when we talk to our students, we want to tell them you gotta stay focused because there are so many questions out of there. If you touch upon this, leave this behind, 
then work on another thing, work on another thing, maybe you get nothing work. So sometimes, if you already know this is the right question you want to ask, and your curiosity is there, you need to stay focused on it, continue to work on it, work hard on it. And I think the final I would advise all of us to be a scientist, you have to be very honest. Because what we are trying to do is trying to find the truth behind everything we study. So sometimes maybe what we observed is not correct, or sometimes what our interpretation is not correct. However, what you need to be honest to your colleagues, to your professors, to all the human beings is what your honest observation is, what your honest thinking is. This is very important to be a scientist. So those are my seven bonnet point to have fun and to be successful. You have to have a strong desire, self-motivation. You have to ask the right question. Then you need to have creative, creativity and imagination. You have to have the ownership, responsibility, and you need to make a right decision and you stay focused to be a good scientist, you need to be honest. And we often say you work hard, you observe carefully, and sometimes we need to think outside the box. This is what we normally work in the nap or after work because we work on the both the heart and the muscle, so we sometimes try to exercise our muscle. I think um, for many of us, we think our job is stressful. You need to produce and you need to make progress. But I think um, my own experience is it is fun because as I told you, as a childhood, you want to play in the playground, you want to get an answer for your curiosity, curiosity questions, and as an adult, you still can do it. As a scientist, you have the fortune to do that. So I think I plan just to stop here and just bring you back the beautiful image of Boston and I hope uh, some of you will be able to visit us in Boston. And finally, I would invite uh, any questions here. Thank you so much. What kind of skills and abilities do you think that a good scientist must have to be successful in his or her career? Thinking about youngers, younger investigators, the, like younger students, what do you think that they must have to be successful in their careers? Um, thanks for the question. Uh, so the question is, uh, for younger students, what is the most important character to be succeed? Um, I think the first one I was talking about uh, should be your self-motivation, your career goal. Uh, you really want to do it. That will drive your career uh, being successful and also you're gonna have more fun. How is uh, the experience for you with uh, students fr uh, from the, the other countries? Like Brazil, China, because it's different cultures going to your lab. How is this experience for you? Um, could you talk a little bit for us? Yeah, okay. So thank you for this question. Um, um, my laboratory at uh, Boston uh, is a very branded of international. So I was fortunate to have uh, American postdoc uh, students and I have a student poster from Europe, then I have a student poster from South America, including this lovely country, Brazil and Peru, and I have a student from China, Japan, and uh, Korea. So I think actually um, this brings back to my um, focus of doing science is fun. Um, that's another thing 
when we are doing our science, we have opportunity to interact with human beings, particularly in this uh, global world, different continent with different background. So I often observe as a Chinese myself, and some of my students are Chinese, they tend to work very hard. They try to say, okay, I just have to make a successful career. So they try to work a pretty long time in the lab. Then I observe a different cultural background, like people from South American, they just try to actually enjoy the process more than some other students. So when they observe something, they got much more excited about it. And some of the students um, would call me up Saturday evening at uh, 10 o'clock, say, hey, Professor Wang, I got uh, this result. You know, um, it's very exciting. Then I also got excited, so I drove back to the laboratory. Then we look at those data over, and I think uh, that's uh, uh, very fun. It's uh, more than watch a uh, football game or NBA game. Um, then you probably, when you grow up more, and there are many young students, you are going to appreciate the human um, different culture, different background bring together human beings. At the end, you are going to say, well, sometimes we speak a little bit different language. We have a different, different way of thinking. However, scientists bring human beings on the same page. We ask uh, very similar questions. We took a very similar approaches. And uh, we learn from each other. And this is also a very fun part. So I don't know I directly answer your question or not, but uh, uh, I think in a laboratory environment uh, to study as a student, to do experiment as a postdoc, to supervise them as a professor, I think it's a blast to have uh, really this intellectual interaction, uh, intellectual stimulation. Sometimes I could not sleep at night because I think this is so exciting. Um, uh, I was wondering, do you think we born scientist leaders or we may develop skills of a scientist a leader? Um, are we born scientists, scientists or are we born scientists and leaders? Um, I think so, um, unless you want to pursue some different career. And as I already said, when we were born, we were so curious about the world around us, we asked the questions. But if you decide to stop it, I mean, that's your, ch your choice. But if you want to continue to do it, I think so.